Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this event here in the Cryosphere Pavilion. Here we're going to be talking about regional ocean acidification with examples from the Northeast Atlantic and the North Sea. I'm Dr. Helen Finley from Plymouth Marine Laboratory. I'm the um, I'm on the Executive Council for the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network and a co-chair for the Northeast Atlantic of, um, Regional Hub of the Go On Network. Um, you may be wondering why we're talking about Northeast Atlantic and North Sea in the Cryosphere Pavilion, but hopefully you'll see that what we're describing here in these examples is things that will be happening in the polar oceans, but actually these events are occurring in hotspots around the world. And we thought it would be a great way to bring to um, bring the polar oceans much closer to home, much closer to around Europe, and also provide examples of elsewhere in coastal regions where these um, events are happening more frequently. So before I move on to our panelists, I'd like to just provide a little context to ocean acidification and the talks today. Um, so I'm going to provide a little bit of an introduction um, to ocean acidification and some of the issues surrounding it. So firstly, what is ocean acidification? The oceans naturally take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and that carbon dioxide reacts in seawater to form um, to become part of the marine carbonate system. Because of that, it's taken up about 30% of the emissions from anthropogenic sources since the Industrial Revolution. But if we add too much too quickly, that, re that results in a shift and imbalance in that carbonate system. And that's resulting in the oceans becoming more acidic, a decline in the ocean pH, and also a decrease in, importantly, these carbonate iron minerals, which is essentially making the oceans in some parts become more corrosive to important minerals of calcium carbonate. These calcium carbonate minerals are important for organisms that need them to build their shells and skeletons like shellfish and corals. So what are we talking about for future projections? These maps in red show areas where the water will become undersaturated or essentially corrosive to these calcium carbonate minerals by the end of the century or year round. Under two different emission scenarios, you can see in the top panel is the high emission scenarios where we end up in a three or four degree a world versus the low emission scenarios where we stick to the Paris Agreement or a one and a half degree world. You can see that the polar oceans are most at risk with the majority, if not all, of the Arctic and Southern oceans becoming undersaturated or corrosive um, by the end of the century. In the low emission scenarios, we can actually help prevent a lot of that from happening, although we still have these areas where we're committed now to having those um, hotspots of ocean acidification already. But what you'll also notice is that further down away from the polar regions are these other areas in the surface waters where you can see these events happening as well. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And we'll hear from um, some modeling work of the North Sea and around the area to highlight exactly how that's manifesting um, and projected to the future. But we also know there's areas away from the surface ocean. The ocean is a very deep, well-mixed ocean in parts. And what goes on in the deep water is also important as well. And we know that there's the change in circulation is affecting ocean acidification in deep waters too. So we can see things like wind-driven upwelling occurring on the coastal regions where we have periodic low pH waters coming up onto the shelves um, that are causing detrimental impacts as well. And we also know that, for example, in the Northeast Atlantic, we have deep water formation. So the sea ice that's forming in the Arctic um, is contributes to the circulation patterns of the ocean. And as it does so, it actually takes that um, CO2 from the surface into the deep waters as well. So we're getting high rates of acidification in the middle and deep waters of the Atlantic. And what we're seeing, especially around Iceland, where we have long term time series, we can actually see that deep waters um, are changing in their chemistry. And that has significant consequences for the benthic organisms, the organisms that live on the seabed and swim within the whole water column as well. So we're not just concerned about the surface, we're concerned about deep water. And you'll hear from Sebastian Henniger later on about cold water corals and deep water corals and how that relates to those. So why are we interested um, in these uh, ocean acidification in terms of impacts for organisms? Well, the main way that we think about organisms is that they have to maintain a stable physiology. Just like we do, they have to maintain a stable internal pH. 
And that can, that's fine for some organisms like people where we can actually balance out our pH. We have mechanisms to do so. If you're a creature living in, a, in an ocean which is changing the pH, you're much more susceptible to those changes. And some organisms have very little ability to control that as well. So they may be more susceptible to ocean acidification. If you're a calcifying organism, you also have this added energetic cost of trying to maintain your calcified structures under these essentially could be corrosive conditions to them. So there's indirect effects on the physiology, growth, survival, and reproduction um, and behavior of organisms that we expect to see and we do see in laboratory experiments. And then indirect effects such as if you're an adult fish, for example, maybe you have really good mechanisms to control your internal pH, but actually um, you may be affected because your food source is, is impacted more directly. And so there's knock-on consequences indirectly as well. These individual effects have consequences for populations and that manifests up into the ecosystem. And we now know with some clarity in the data that actually we can start to observe trends of change. And we're seeing changes in many different ecosystems from seagrass meadows, carbonate reefs, coral reefs, uh, and pelagic food webs. And all of these have consequences not only for the marine ecosystem, but actually for society as well. And we will hear from Richard Bellaby later on to talk about how we need to work with local communities and stakeholders to actually understand their needs and understand the monitoring that we can combine with those. This is just an example from a couple of years ago, a study looking at how we could incorporate the loss of calcification in some of these mollusk species, so things like clams, mussels, oysters, um, and how we can use those to make an estimate of the economic loss, um, especially in Europe, in this case, um, based on that calcification loss by the end of the century. And you can see even on these very um, limited data sets, the estimates are in the order of a billion US dollars by the end of the century if we follow these high emission scenarios. So there are significant consequences to ocean acidification in all of these regions. Um, and the polar oceans are particularly susceptible, but as well as these hotspot areas. And finally, today you'll hear from Jesse Turner from the Ocean Acidification Alliance to look about how we can actually take some of that knowledge and put that into OA action. So we're going to be hearing a little bit about the Alliance, um, but thinking about how we need to really minimize the impacts of ocean acidification and really try and stick to that Paris Agreement emissions um, to really reduce emissions, protect the ecosystems, and invest in science partnerships so that we can better understand um, what's going on. So that's it from me for today. Um, I'll be moderating the rest of the session. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome a special address from uh, Bill Turner, who is uh, currently Head of Environment Mon Monitoring and Assessment for Marine Scotland. Bill's gonna be joining us virtually um, and he's going, he manages a portfolio of research and monitoring in marine environments. He provides advice to the Scottish government on all areas of marine environmental science. He currently does personal research in marine litter, marine carbon, carbon capture and storage, and marine monitoring. And he's going to be talking to us today um, about some of the Marine Scotland's ambitions and their monitoring program. Um, so thank you very much. Hi, thank you very, thank you. Um, Firstly, on behalf of the Scottish Government, I'd like to welcome this meeting and all the attendees to Scotland. Uh, we're very glad you're here and we know how critical the work of COP26 and all the, the side events is to all our futures, so thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank the organisers for allowing us to speak um, at the meeting. As Helen says, I, I lead marine monitoring and assessment here in Marine Scotland. Marine Scotland is the directorate of the Scottish Government that's responsible for the management of our seas and of the marine industries which form the blue economy. Our vision for Scottish seas is to have clean, healthy, safe, productive and diverse seas managed to meet the needs of nature and people. And climate change caused by the, the increase of anthropogenic atmospheric greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, is threatening that vision and is creating pressures and impacts throughout our waters. Ocean acidification, that's often called the other CO2 problem, is part of the threat to the health and diversity of Scottish seas. So when we consider monitoring, um, obviously ocean acidification is part of the carbonate system, but it's a complex parameter to monitor. And in order to interpret changes we see, we need 
data on multiple physical, chemical, and biological parameters that include parameters such as total alkalinity, dissolved inorganic carbon, pH, dissolved oxygen, nutrients, chlorophyll, phytoplankton, and of course, temperature and salinity. The chemical analysis of water samples for parameters like total alkalinity and dissolved or inorganic carbon is time consuming, is a time consuming process. And currently in the UK, there are not many laboratories that can perform the necessary chemical analysis. We know that uh, new in situ sensors are being developed and have the potential to improve monitoring, but these always need to be validated and calibrated using discrete sample data. And they also need the suite of supporting parameters that are needed to interpret ocean acidification data. And we must remember that changes in ocean acidification parameters in our seas will not occur in isolation, but will also occur alongside changes in all the other relevant ocean parameters. And such changes may act together to impact biota and the marine ecosystem. And all this concludes that we, we need comprehensive and holistic monitoring. In the, North, in the North Sea, there's currently quite a lack of high frequency in situ monitoring. Model data is available, but again, this has to be always calibrated and validated using in situ monitoring. Currently in the UK, there's only two um, high frequency time series stations that exist. One of them is in Scotland in, at the Stonehaven station, which is just south of Aberdeen, where I am just now. And that is part of the Scottish Coastal Observatory. It's just off the coast uh, from Scotland. And the second station is the L4 station in the English Channel, run by the Western Channel Observatory. Both of these stations so, show similar seasonality in carbonate parameters, but Stonehaven shows higher variability in many timescales, weekly, monthly, and interannual. And we see the influence of many processes such as inflows from offshore and inflows from local rivers. And all this high variability makes the interpretation of single survey data by a research vessel in our shelf waters difficult. Deeper waters, as Helen says, will be particularly prone to decreases in pH due to the influence of the increased water pressure. And in our deep waters, north and west of Scotland, we have habitats and species that may be extremely vulnerable to acidification, such as the cold water coral reefs that we'll hear about later. So in Scotland, we're trying to expand our monitoring related to ocean acidification, partly using funding from programs such as Interreg. Uh, we've established a carbonate chemistry laboratory, and we're beginning to invest in sensors that can be mounted on buoys and autonomous vehicles. We're also currently focusing on understanding the impact of acidification, particularly on calcifying plankton, such as pelagic gastropods, and uh, the pelagic larvae of benthic species such as bivalves, as these form an important part of the base of the marine food chain. However, more monitoring is needed if we are to say anything about long-term trends in ocean pH. We also need better spatial coverage of monitoring sites to improve our understanding of carbonate chemistry at the reg regional level. And we should also remember that if offshore carbon capture and storage commences in the North Sea on a large scale, monitoring agen agencies such as our own will need the capability to monitor, understand, and model carbonate chemistry changes due to potential leakages from geological stores as well as from other infrastructure. And we, we will need to do that within the background of regional ocean acidification. So in summary, our understanding of the, the, the impacts of changes to the ocean carbon chemistry system, including ocean acidification and related parameters, is still lacking in our coastal and regional environments. This knowledge gap is in part due to a lack of integrated and sustained observations at, sufficient, at sufficiently high resolution in time and space. Addressing this will require expansion of measurements of pH and all the related carbon parameters and the supporting parameters need to be collected. The ultimate impacts of increasing acidity on our regional seas remains uncertain, 
So we need to continue to expand our observing systems, as well as undertaking studies of the response of organisms and the ecosystem to acidification. And we need to use these studies to improve the simulation of the regional carbonate system and how the marine food web interacts with it. So we're really looking forward to today's session and we're sure we're gonna learn a great deal from all your work. So thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you very much, Bill. It's a pleasure to have you here and hear about the work that Marine Scotland is doing. Our next speaker is Dr. Yuri Artioli, who's a senior marine ecosystem modeler at Plymouth Marine Laboratory. He's studying the impacts of climate change, ocean acidification, and direct anthropogenic stresses on marine ecosystems. His main interest is on the variability of the environment and its role in determining the severity of the impacts of climate stresses. This focus is primarily on shelf sea and coastal areas and the areas of the ocean that provide the most resources and services to our society. He chairs the Ecosystem Modelling Activity Group of the UK National Partnership of Ocean Prediction, promoting the power of marine ecosystem models for planning, designing and monitoring marine policies and activities. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Ellen, and uh, good morning, everybody. So as Ellen said, I'm going to show some uh, pro projection of regional ocean acidification in uh, the North Sea. And uh, with Helen already e explained uh, that uh, what is ocean acidification and that starts from the imbalance uh, from the uh, atmospheric PCO2 and the carbon dioxide uh, in, in the water resulting in lower pH and, and lower saturation state that is an, in an indicator of the corrosiveness uh, of the water for for calcium car carbonate. And uh, we know that glob global ocean, ocean models are, uh, pr are projecting uh, that ocean acidification is happening and will continue to happen. The, uh, the severity will obviously depend on the scenario, uh, em on the emission scenarios, but we'll still have uh, uh, ocean acidification will continue to happen even in the uh, low em emission scenario and the recovery will be very slow uh, from, from, from those. As Helen showed, there is latitudinal gradient uh, of uh, the uh, severity of ocean acidification. And also ver vertically, the last series of map is, shows the uh, depth of the uh, saturation horizon for Aragonite. So where the depth at which uh, the saturation state goes below one, and so the water become, become corrosive. And as you see, this is the RCP 8.5 scenarios. These, these are getting shallower and uh, in, in, high la in high latitude, uh, la la like in the polar region, this will uh, uh, reach the uh, surface. But if we take this global model and we go down with downscale uh, at the regional scale, we can see that uh, these big uh, uh, variability pattern uh, um, are not the only variability that, that is there. There are much more uh, variability, both uh, in present day as in the picture on the right, uh, the left for you, sorry, uh, where you, you see that the, uh, the un, un, annual mean of, of, of pH can, can vary significantly of some uh, tenth of unit that for, that for pH is, is very significant considering that is a lo logarithmic scale that uh, um, across great gradient like coastal to, uh, to center of the, of the North Sea or shelf and off shelf. And then if, if you look at, at pro projection in, in the middle, it's RCP 4.5 4, 4. On, on the top and 8.5 on the bottom. You, you can clearly see that both scenarios, you, you see brighter color, more yellow colors showing exactly that uh, acidification. But when you start looking at the real differences between uh, the, 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 current pro, the current surface pH and, and, the, and the projection, you can see that the intensity of the, of the acidification can vary uh, also at that small scale and it can vary significantly like also like being like uh, half, half of the, for, for instance, on, on the coast can be half uh, of the, the, the one in the, in the center and the North, North Sea. And this variability is due to, to several factors, temperature, sanity, productivity of, of the areas. And it's not just a horizontal variability at, at, at the surface. Oh yeah, and there is, uh, luckily for uh, at 2050, there, uh, the model pro project no uh, surface under saturation. However, if you look at this at the, at the vertical variability, Helen uh, said 
about the uh, the vertical variability for the, the deep ocean, but even in, in shelf, despite being relatively shallow, that there is an, an important process that can lead to to seasonal uh, acidification and seasonal undersaturation in in the future. And you, well, during during summer, the water warms up, and then when when the water is when the water column is uh, uh, particularly uh, deep, uh, uh, above let's say on, uh, between 50, 100 meter and further, then uh, the bottom water can uh, uh, can be ba basically physically uh, separated by uh, the uh, surface from, from from the surface water, and this is also the time when phytoplankton, small algae, grows. Then they die, reach the bottom, and here they are eaten and then respirated, uh, and then and then the carbon is respired uh, by a lot of animal and uh, by bacteria, producing even more CO2 that is that is trapped in this bottom water that that, that are stratified and separated from the surface water, so they can't go any and anywhere, and so you, you have further uh, acidification. And this actually the the, mo the model shows that this can lead to uh, seasonal undersaturation in bottom water in the North Sea and and the Celtic Sea, um, e even by by 2050 and even uh, in the RCP 4.5 scenarios. By by 2050, the, these areas are relatively small, confined in the uh, south south of Ireland or uh, in the um, e eastern part of of the North Sea, and you and. There is not much different by 2050 between the, the RCP 4.5 scenario and the 8.5 scenario, but you can barely see that the uh, RCP 8.5 scenario by 2050 start, seems to start to ramp up. And indeed, if we run further to 2100, we see that this, this trend continues to uh, in, in increase and there is no uh, real uh, sign of that uh, stopping and going to a saturation. And just for reference, the dashed line that you see in in the in the plot on the left uh, is the maximum value that was uh, in 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 the previous graph. So the surface that actually be, uh, of the seafloor that become undersaturated in the North Sea uh, under the uh, RCP 8.5 scenario increased massively, like seven times more than uh, the the one uh, projected by the, the model by uh, 2050. And in in the map on on the, the left, you see how the yellow area, so the undersaturated area. Increase a lot, and uh, uh, and and also how frequent this undersaturation become. The the yellow area are are the area where in the, in that 20 year win, uh, uh, time window uh, is basically the seafloor will be undersaturated constantly. While then uh, and then the, the bluer the, the the color the less frequent. And so there is a lot of, of variability of, of of this signal as also the blue line on the left. Uh, plot shows with, with a, a, a big seasonal cycle there. And to better appreciate this variability, you, uh, I, I'm going to show a movie now from, or an animation from uh, the saturation state uh, from a, a transect that goes from, from, the, uh, Be from the Belgian coast up north uh, to the, uh, close to the, Nor to the Norwegian coast. And uh, when you will see red, that means that that part of water will become undersaturated. We start from 2050 for to make it quicker. And you have seen a, like a, a jump of red uh, that is a, just an occasional undersaturation. And then by 2070 and then 2080, we see that more and more red start, start to appear. And you see a lot of, of, of the variability, the seasonal cycle. And by the end of, of, of the century, the bottom water are continuously under, under, undersaturated. And you can actually see that in winter, this undersaturation will actually reach the, the uh, surface as, as well. So, and, and this can have also obviously a lot of impact uh, on, on the on the biology because what the animal can uh, some animal can react to that and, and move some other animal cannot and uh, uh, and and the time variability uh, allow can allow for some uh, an, an animal or some e ecosystem to actually uh, cope with this e extra stressor but in uh, that time that extra uh, variability can 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 actually be a uh, problem so to conclude, the, the take-home message uh, are that, as probably we all know, if we're sitting here, all, all acidification is happening also on shelf seas, and is more variable than uh, in, in 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 the ocean because it, this is the nature of of of, of, of shelf seas. Uh, um, they are environments that are more much more dynamic, where a lot more things happen. With there is the interaction with with the land and, and so on. 
the vertical variability is, is, is also important. It's not just a matter of surface pH or surface sat saturation state. And, and uh, uh, in, in shelf water, there, there can be se uh, seasonal acidification uh, occurring in, in bottom water because of the, of the stratification. The model projects that, that seasonal undersaturation in, in the North Sea and, and the Celtic Sea will become a more recurrent uh, feature uh, particularly under the uh, high em emission scenario by the end of the century. And obviously, as I, as, as I just explained and, and Helen showed, uh, this has uh, a knock-on con 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 consequences uh, for uh, the uh, impact on, on biology, particularly on the benthic or, or, or organism uh, that have uh, less ability to actually like move move around and uh, uh, exploit that uh, that vari that variability. And with this, I uh, thank you all, and I thank uh, uh, the funders of the uh, research, the uh, UKRI through the project Recycle, and the European Union through the project Comfort. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuri, and I think that really gives us a a really good starting point to understand how much variability and, and the situation that we will experience if we carry on on a high emissions scenario. So our next speaker is another virtual speaker. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sebastian Henniger. He's a senior lecturer, senior lecturer in marine science from the University of Edinburgh. Sebastian re researches the impact of ocean acidification on marine organisms and ecosystems with particular focus on tropical and cold water coral reefs. His research at the University of Edinburgh includes experimental work where organisms are exposed to projected future conditions, as well as in situ work to examine already organisms already living at the forefront of environmental change. He was a lead editor on the Convention of, on Biological Diversity's report on the impact of ocean acidification on marine biodiversity and a contributing author to the Second World Ocean Assessment and to the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. And Seb is going to be talking to us about ocean education and cold water corals. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, yes, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. Uh, so yes, my name is Sebastian Henniger from the University of Edinburgh. And today I want to focus on cold water corals, ocean acidification and habitat loss. So to start with, I'd like to just take a step back and let's have a look at the wide distribution of these cold water coral reefs. And this is from the uh, United Nations Environmental Monitoring Programme. And we can see that we've got these cold water corals all over and all around from high to low latitudes and all the way across our seas. And importantly, these cold water corals go from relatively shallow, maybe 30 meters, all the way down to 3000 meters deep. Now that's the global picture, but if we go look a little bit more locally now, so as we're all sitting in Scotland and here we have a look off our west coast and off Irish waters as well, we can see some of our very well characterized coral reefs in these red dots here. So we have more, but the well characterized ones are these red dots. Now what I'd like you to take from this graph is that our coral reefs, our cold water coral reefs are in a variety of different situations. We've got some shallow ones, which are just off the Outer Hebrides, the Mingale Reef Complex, only about 150 meters deep. And then we've got deeper ones offshore and off the Southwest coast as well, we've got canyon corals as well. So we've got a variety of different depths and all of these cold water corals are in different water currents as well, which means that the chemistry they're going to be getting is different between all the reefs and the food supply is different as well. And we've already heard a little bit about uh, local changes and how this, and how we've seen from some of the projections from Yuri about how some of these reefs may change quite differently from each other. So the main coral, which I'm going to be focusing on today is Lophelia pertusa. And this is the main framework forming cold water coral. And it's pictured here in the, the left and right images. Now these can go down to 3000 meters and they create just like their tropical counterparts, these very massive and very complex three-dimensional habitats made up of the live coral, which is the white and the orange coral on this picture on the right here, which sits on top of this dead coral framework. And quite often, these habitats are mostly made of the dead coral with, a, with the live coral just sitting on top. Now, the structure of these habitats are in, increasingly important. And the, the amount of biodiversity which they can support is in part um, due to the dead skeleton. 
So it's not just the live coral which is important, but the dead coral skeleton can host huge amounts of biodiversity. And we even know that sharks and eggs will lay their egg cases within these frameworks, within these habitats. So they're very important for, for juvenile and nursery um, provision as well. Now, as I mentioned before, the skeletons from these dead corals are critical to this structure. And we can think of the dead corals as actually providing the foundation framework for the entire ecosystem. So we know from our long-term experiments that cold water corals, the live cold water corals can survive to an extent, and there's lots of caveats around that, but they can survive to an extent in future conditions. But we've now realized that we need to take a much harder look at the dead coral skeleton as well, which is, as I mentioned previously, almost the main part of these habitats. So we need to start thinking, how will ocean acidification affect these ecosystems? And will the habitat and ecosystem quality of these ecosystems change in the future? And also linked with that, how will this impact upon biodiversity? So here is a CT scan, so you can think of this as an X-ray going down uh, two coral skeletons here. So these are corals which were collected from the west coast of the state in reefs which are already living at in ocean acidification conditions, in conditions which are representative of what most cold water coral reefs will experience by the end of the century. And on the left hand side, we've got a skeleton which from a coral which was alive when we collected it, so the skeleton was protected by coral tissue. And on the right hand side, we've got a coral which was dead when it was collected. So there was no protective tissue and the skeleton was open to the ocean acidification conditions. And what we can see on the right hand side is that around the edges of the coral, it's got lots of little black dots. It looks a little bit spongy around the outside. And this is because the cold water coral skeleton is starting to, to dissolve. It's becoming more porous than it is now. And this has drastic implications to the strength of these dead coral skeletons. And this is very important because these coral skeletons are supporting the entire ecosystem above them. So as ocean acidification dissolves part of this, it makes it weaker, it makes it brittle, and we can start to see a crumbling of that habitat. And we can see that in this schematic here. So in the middle of this image, we've got a cold water coral reef system. We've got a cold water coral reef, which is made up of live and dead material on the top. And then we've got this dashed line, which goes through this slice of coral reef. And this is the aragonite saturation horizon. And below this, this is when this dead coral skeleton can start to dissolve. Now, this aragonite saturation horizon is becoming shallower and shallower and shallower. At the moment, the majority of our reefs are above this aragonite saturation horizon. But by the end of the century, the majority of our coral reefs are going to be below this aragonite saturation horizon. And what will happen is that this dead coral skeleton starts to become more porous and we see a crumbling, a simplification of that habitat, a loss of biodiversity support. And this is... We're starting to see this already at reefs already at the forefront of this environmental change. And we can see this, we can validate this from our institute in our laboratory studies as well. So what are our key challenges going forward? Well, we've seen that this can happen and we've seen some of the rates of this in the lab, but what we need to understand now is what is the rate or how fast will these ecosystems start to undergo this habitat loss? And then, of course, we need to take the forward look and say, how can we model this in these different regional approaches globally and locally as well? And we also need to understand what impacts this will have on the associated biodiversity and food webs as well. We know that it will be a vastly different habitat, but what will that mean in terms of the amounts and types of biodiversity that it will support? And how will this cascade up the food chain? So going forward, when we think about what the solutions are, of course, we need to be limiting our carbon emissions. And we have seen that this can also, there's various things that we can do on a local scale as well. So as I uh, mentioned earlier, we've got reefs off the west coast of Scotland and Ireland, which are in very different situations. So by understanding how fast the water chemistry is changing in these places, so by introducing a lot more local monitoring, we'll understand how fast these changes are now. And this will feed directly into more localized models as well to see how fast or how quickly these different reefs will become acidified in the future. Because we've got many different cold water coral reefs, they will not all be under the same risk and at the same threat at the same time. So we need to really bring all our work together to have a look at this going forward. And then ultimately, we want to know what coral ecosystems are going to be at risk and when. And so I'd just like to finish on this picture here. So this was a picture which I took from inside the Yago submersible off the reef of Norway. And this is just through the dome port at the front of the submersible. And I think it's, 
it's a wonderful way to go down and view these habitats. And typically we've been limited with the amount of information we can gain from these habitats by just how difficult they are to assess. They're at the bottom of the ocean. They're very expensive and difficult to get down to. But through the increases in monitoring, the, the rapid advances in modeling approaches, which we've already seen as they come to the forefront as well, and through our lab experiments as well, we're really starting to build this picture that over the next few years, we really should have a better idea about how, how much of a risk these different coral ecosystems will be at. And then that will give us the tools and the power to bring in other local management measurements, start to reduce other stresses as well, and really give these reefs the best chance at survival in terms of the habitat quality going forward. So I'd like to say thank you very much um, for listening and I welcome any questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. That's um, a really nice way of uh, highlighting the risks of some of these habitats that we're maybe less aware of, but are actually fundamental for the biodiversity of our ecosystems and societies that rely on them. So our next speaker is Professor Richard Bellaby. Professor Richard Bellaby is Chief Scientist, uh, Climate and Oceans at the Norwegian Institute for Water Research in Norway, Directi Director of the Skelvik Niva Center for Marine Coastal Research at ECNU in Shanghai, China, and adjunct professor for faculty of applied sciences, UCSI, UCSI Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. So he's taking over the world slowly, I think. Um, he, his research is on understanding and optimizing the interface between science and policy regarding marine system management and under shifting marine ecosystems and climate change. And he is co-leader of the Inver Future Earth Coast Continental Margins Working Group leads the Arctic Council AMAP Working Group on Ocean Acidification and sits on the GOAN Executive Council, as well as being an SSC member for SCAR Integrated Climate and Ecosystems Dynamics Working Group. Busy man. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak to you today. And thank you to the previous speakers to introduce the topic so well, and uh, I will try and integrate a lot of those messages in a way we have, in an approach we have used to make ocean acidification knowledge more appropriate to local users. Um, it's a real challenge, and I, I know when I sit in other disciplines, in this, in other events, the terminology is complicated, the numbers don't mean anything. And if you go to a Norwegian fisherman and say, you should be really, you should be really concerned because the pH is dropping by 0 0.0017 units a year, it means absolutely nothing to them. So we turn science on its head, science knowledge production on its head. And we luckily got a, a Norwegian Research Council project to co-produce climate change and ocean acidification knowledge for selected parts of local Norway. And we went there with, in an approach where we didn't actually tell them anything. All we went there with the tools that we had, the instruments to measure OA well, the models to downscale and produce projections, but everything was based on their uh, decisions. We sample, well, I'll go into it anyway. Well, we should have actually discussed uh, our slides because you're going to see a little bit of a reproduction here, uh, but it's always good to hear the same message twice. It's clear from the CMIP-6 models that are now in the, uh, uh, the latest IPCC AR6, uh, almost to be delivered report um, that pH is going to go down independent of, of scenario. And there's also pretty good re agreement amongst all the models on a global scale. This is the red line, well, the red line for worst case scenario, the pink is the, the standard deviation around all the models. So there's a massive confidence that this is going to happen. It's one of the strongest uh, we have the highest confidence of most of the climate indicators in pH. But as um, Yuri showed, this is not appropriate 
Oh, the, the skill is, but they haven't been designed to deliver regional scale knowledge. They d certainly haven't been designed to produce local scale knowledge. And uh, you have to forgive me for self-promotion, but I do like this figure. And it shows why it's so important to um, really focus in on specific drivers of ocean acidification. Uh, do we have any pointers now? Um, as well as the, the red uh, arrows, which is a more elaborate way of showing acidification. I'm very grateful that uh, Helen and Yuri showed it better than, uh, can communicate it better than I can. But what's most important and is increasingly important is the strong connectivity with land, either through coastal erosion, but specifically, or more importantly, in most of the regions, is a growing influence of, of fluvial, of riverine input, the freshwater, the organic carbon. Freshwater affects ocean acidification, organic carbon supply, obviously through the similar processes that, that have been discussed earlier of increased respiration and increased CO2 uh, production following that. But we also, and this is the cryosphere part, because Norway goes actually up into the, the North, Northeast Atlantic does go up into the, in, in, into the, into the Arctic. We see sea ice reductions we see changes in the connectivity, the, the connectivity between the atmosphere and the ocean. We see different rates of, of, uh, of, of ocean acidification. So I have to admit as well, I know this is an IPCC, uh, sorry, a, uh, a high level meeting. This is unpublished. This is just for information. We do have the capacity at NEVA, it just hasn't been published yet, but this is the pH detail at 800 meters in the fjords. So we're, go we're going even one step further into the, the, the bits and pieces of uh, the coastal system. But if you are a, sorry, I sh shouldn't really point, if you, are, if you have an aquaculture unit here, this is quite irrelevant for you. Oops, sorry. It's quite irrelevant for you to get information of the water offshore. So this was our challenge. This is how we interacted with the stakeholders. First, we went to talk to them about what's important. What is their ecosystem? What are their ecosystem services? We discussed with them the stresses because, yes, we know that there's going to be warming. We know there's going to be deoxygenation, but they've been working. They've been fishing that same area for 50 years. They've been... Uh, walking that same walk and looking at that uh, beautiful uh, beach or that beautiful seaweed uh, ecosystem. We actually got them to sample for us as well. We trained them. So where they decided we want, they wanted us to, sam to, to sample, they went out in their boats and we got the fisheries high school and we got trawlermen to go and take water from them. They fixed it at, at, according to the, our high quality approaches that we use stand, standardized. We then evaluated the observations, um, evaluated to, to, to a certain degree potential ecosystem responses, and then we used that to inform pro uh, model projections. And all the time, they were involved at every step. And what's most important is the stakeholder action part, because it's only when they are fully informed that you actually get local action. Just to give you an example of the advantages of this, we got to sample um, closer to aquaculture units than is permissible by Norwegian law because they trusted us. We couldn't go up there. They would think we're going to try and close them down if we talked about ocean acidification, climate change, and aquaculture. But they really did uh, understand what we were doing. So we were combining local concerns, which also affect ocean acidification, the hospital waste, the abattoir runoff, these are not things we normally talk about as climate researchers, but they're more important to this particular corner of the fjord than acidification, but they work together. The, run up, the abattoir runoff makes that part of the ocean more susceptible to ocean acidification. The pH change will, will be faster in that particular part of the fjord. But we also reached out to the aquaculture, but also the restaurants and the, the seafood restaurants as well. So we got the full uh, information chain going. This is the only real scientific. Uh... So this is what we did just for one fjord, and this is in 
uh, Lofoten, Lofoten Islands, the beautiful white coral beaches and uh, coralline beaches. And this is just using some recent examples. So on the left is pH at 1 meter, 20 meter, 55 meters, and this is the aragonite saturation. And we just used some recently published uh, thresholds for eco important ecosystem players in that region. Uh, green sea urchins are controlling the kelp forests. This is ocean acidification's charismatic polar equivalent of the polar bear, the sea butterfly, but they also play a very important role in the ecosystem. And obviously, most people like lobsters and to look at and to eat. But you see that already, and I'm not going to go into detail, we can talk about specific things later, but there are times where even now we have acidification in the surface, which is 2,100 levels from uh, a science mo model. So taking it straight from the IPCC would be not relevant for this system. But we see that there are particular by 2030 sea urchins, certain life stages of sea urchins would be unsustainable, for example. So a brief summary. I hope it's understandable throughout both through Yuri's and mine that global change does not equal local change. And we need to learn how to downscale. We still, we're still reliant on our system models, but we need to optimize the tools on how to get those messages down to the local level. And I think, and it, this really is, ocean acidification should be developed, undertaken, and evaluated with stakeholders. Before the end of this project, the SRIA project, they had already put in local regulation to take the gray water out of the fjord. They're, all, they're now negotiating with the wetland managers and the agriculture to look at the timing of plowing and the, and the application of nutrients. So this wouldn't have happened if I'd have sent them a PDF of my latest paper. So this is the two extremes of how it should be done. And uh, just a, a bit of an advertisement, but this is required for SDG 14.3, the, the pH um, SDG deliverable. And I hope and I understand it will be sort of a, not necessarily a template, but a good starting point for the new uh, decade program ORS, which we're starting under the Go On project. So thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. And I think that's a really important point that um, actually someone raised yesterday is how can we speed up the process of getting science into policy and by working with stakeholders from the very beginning and getting their engagement is surely the best way to do that, I think. So we're going to finish up by hearing from Jesse Turner from Cascadia Policy Solutions and the International Alliance to Combat Oceanistication. Jesse uh, leads advocacy and facilitation projects at local, state and regional and international levels and has um, over 10 years of experience working in public policy development, advocacy and stakeholder engagement. She's currently facilitated to the Pacific Coast Collaborative, a collaboration between states of California, Oregon, Washington, and the province of British Columbia in Canada, working together on climate and energy issues that impact the North American West Coast region. In that role, Jesse has led the PCC Ocean Acidification Working Group and assisted in the creation of the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification, where she's now um, Secretariat for the OA Alliance and helps set its strategic development direction develops annual monitoring and programs sorry develops annual programming establishes partnerships um across a wide discipline and coalition so jesse thank you very much great well thank you uh helen and all the presenters um I'm always so inspired and humbled by a set of great set of presentations that help frame up this issue. And indeed, the um, project that Dr. Bellaby just outlined is a great example of the types of things that we are trying to get governments to do more of um, and more intentionally. So it's a great queue up. And uh, as Helen mentioned, my name is Jesse Turner, and you will not uh, hear a reproduction of OA science in any of my slides because I am not a scientist, but I am the uh, director of the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification, and glad to be here at the Cryosphere Pavilion. So to begin, just with a little bit of context, the OA Alliance was created in 2016 by three subnational governments 
in direct response to some of the first ever observed impacts on oyster hatchery, oyster hatchery production across the North American West Coast. Uh, and it was really because of these early impacts that shellfish growers, tribal governments, scientists, uh, and state governments, notably, got activated early along the West Coast of North America to lay the foundation for engaging other national and subnational governments around OA action. Uh, and just for context, uh, since we launched in 2016, we now have over 100 members, including national, state, tribal, First Nation governments, and even some local municipalities uh, like cities and ports. Uh, and together, we are working to really do three big things. The first is to elevate urgency and ambition for climate action. The second is to integrate ocean into climate commitments. And the third is to translate knowledge into policy action, which is primarily what we'll chat about today. Uh, so as, as you've heard, you know, the science and research and observed impacts of ocean acidification continue to grow. And there is really this continued need for increased knowledge exchange on the substance and the policy uh, or substance and the process for developing these local, regional and national policy strategies in the face of this cumulative change that is happening in the global ocean. But as uh, the presentations have revealed, coastally as well. Uh, and so in order to engage our members, we ask them to create what we call these OA action plans, um, which really describe the actions that members will take or are taking to better understand and respond to the threat of ocean acidification uh, and climate ocean change within their regions. And I won't read all of these to you, but these are the action plan categories that we have listed. And you can see that they have a blend of national actions uh, as well as regional and local based activities. And it's important to note that no one size is going to fit all. Um, and we really stress some of the themes that you've heard today, which is, yes, we need to reduce carbon emissions, uh, but there are things that governments can and should be doing now. Uh, and we really want to get governments motivated around what that looks like, focusing on the targeted science and knowledge, managing local stressors, adaptation and resiliency building strategies. Uh, and really our key message is that it's okay to acknowledge uncertainty and continue to build motivation for local driven action. Uh, and so here's just some examples from partners and members uh, here in the Northeast or here uh, in the Northeast Atlantic region that are beginning to outline what these types of um, strategies look like to fill knowledge gaps and further make priorities around monitoring. Um, and so in the Netherlands, uh, they actually have an OA action plan that was created through the sort of context of the OA Alliance. Canada has a really strong uh, monitoring plan that includes a lot of uh, awareness raising and outreach campaigns. And then the United Kingdom and Sweden have very comprehensive monitoring plans that do include linkages to these broader domestic as well as international goals. Uh, and so what we're really trying to do is to motivate, to engage, to encourage governments to take some of these monitoring plans and priorities a step further towards really trying to actualize uh, policy and localized response strategies in a more uh, targeted and more uh, strategic way. And in doing that, of course, we're hoping that we will have a better understanding of local variability and to take stock of unique vulnerabilities. Uh, as you heard from a lot of the presentations, we really want to continue to have a deeper connection between the science and management in one region and prioritize studies at the local level that will help that uh, feedback loop. Of course, we need everyone needs money. We need to strengthen public and private funding for these types of projects. That's one way that an OA action plan or a localized or domestic national policy can help bring that to bear. Uh, and then finally, we want to continue to show that OA action further helps promote some of these existing commitments to ocean and climate action internationally. So to begin, uh, as you've heard, we're increasingly trying to get a state of the knowledge um, and really make sure that that has some local applicability or some policy applicability. And so what we really need to start doing is to ask and engage policymakers, decision makers, and notably resource managers at a local level um, around the knowledge gaps that need to be filled from their perspective, and specifically how that relates to the existing tools that they might already have to utilize um, relating to solutions, to interventions, um, or what tools that they can expand upon potentially in that field. And of course, these are sort of the series of questions um, that policymakers are constantly thinking about um, 
all the time. So there's only so much time and money. Where do we begin? What species or ecosystems are the most at risk and why? Uh, are there geographical locations, coastal areas, industries, communities in my region that are going to be more vulnerable or in other sense, more resilient? Um, and who are the people in my local region that can help us outline research that's going to have this practical applicability um, that will help us make meaningful investments? And so just a quick look at domestic facing policy. We're really trying to drive this notion that OA should and can be integrated at the domestic level across existing frameworks. Lots of governments have climate action plans or climate adaptation plans, national ocean or shoreline management, water quality monitoring ongoing. And how do we think about uh, enhancing those plans and policies to better reflect climate ocean change? Uh, there was a paper recently released, I think in 2019, that looked particularly at the EU policies uh, for a marine strategy framework directive and how OA might be further incorporated into that particular uh, good standing status. Uh, and then just to note the second bullet here um, that gets a little bit more into the re regulation side. Um, how does OA fit into water quality, stormwater, wastewater, other sources of pollution, and importantly, what's the type of science that's going to help us expand on some of those tools that we might have to think about coastal impacts of ocean acidification or coastal contributions of ocean acidification. And then at the international level, um, we've heard a little bit uh, already about some of these. We have a growing suite of um, frameworks uh, that OA increasingly has more of a direct link that can help accelerate investment and prioritize uh, some of this targeted regional science and information. So of course, we've got SDG 14 that has an OA target and a correlating mon monitoring indicator. We have, of course, the UNFCCC, which is why we're all here, um, and the Ocean and Climate Change Dialogue, which took place in 2020, really helps continue to think about how ocean mitigation and adaptation fits across NDCs, national adaptation plans, um, with really an emphasis on financing, of course. Uh, important to note the Convention on Biological Diversity, there are three targets that either directly relate and call out ocean acidification or indirectly correspond, uh, wanting to really call out target eight about limiting pollution, including from excess nutrients. Uh, going back to the previous presentation, thinking about that coastal acidification and the exacerbating factors that we can control maybe more immediately. Um, so just calling that out as, as one OA related activity that isn't always linked as an OA related activity. Uh, and then finally, as uh, Richard mentioned, we've got the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainability, which we are very um, lucky to note hosts an OA research program, which includes this emphasis on regional information and synthesis for decision making, which is, again, taking it that step further. So what else is needed just to conclude? Um, these are a lot of the things that you already heard about in presentations, but really thinking about do we have regional or national clearinghouses for OA data and importantly synthesis that can be accessed by governments and utilized by governments. Um, continuing to think about globally, do we have baseline monitoring necessary to capture that natural variability um, relative to long-term trends? The Northeast Atlantic, I think, is doing probably well in that category, but are there other places internationally that really need to be bolstered in that type of um, long-term um, uh, information? Talked a lot today about identifying hotspots at local and regional scales. Um, and then of course, this increased focus on biological response and thresholds for key species. I appreciate that we think pteropods are charismatic in our, uh, in our field, so that's good. But uh, how else can we expand the thinking about biological impacts to key species um, that we all rely on, including food uh, web sources? And then a note about the predictive forecast models that are going to inform some of this responsive decision making and management, per ta per taking, into think taking into account things like seasonality um, as well. And why? Well, you've heard all this, but really we want to make sure that people understand that OA is relevant to climate risk and vulnerability assessments. And if you are a coastal community or a coastal government and you've got a climate risk assessment or vulnerability assessment and ocean impacts are not included, that you are missing something probably. Um, we really want science to be able to evaluate and validate um, some of these local interventions and see how those pilots are working. Uh, and then of course, um, we take the view that increased OA activity, OA action, 
helps fill out a more holistic approach to all these other goals that governments are increasingly thinking about promoting and prioritizing and making sure that ocean acidification and ocean climate change helps bolster the approaches to all of these other, uh, all these other pieces of the puzzle. So with that, uh, hope I haven't gone too over and thank you, Helen, for inviting us here. That was perfect. Everyone's been brilliant on time. So that's um, given us a bit of time now for a discussion Q question and answer session. So if there's anyone on um, in the audience that would like to ask a question, then please, I think if you come up to the microphone to the side, to that one there, and then you can ask your question. Everyone should be able to hear it. Does it work? Yeah, great. I'm not a Norwegian fisherman, but I completely sympathize with, with that guy because it's not so easy to understand the, the science. But I want to thank the presenters because I think you, you brought it much closer to other disciplines. So there's a link there. And based on that, I would like to ask a couple of questions for the um, third presenter. Um, what is behind the... Uh, fact that the ocean acidification is increasing faster in the poles. So I, I think I understood that it has to do with uh, uh, freshwater runoff, probably a feedback effect of uh, faster warming, but it would be great to have some, uh, some uh, clarification on that. Uh, also to the second presenter, um, very interested to learn on whether there's uh, some advancement on estimating the half-life of uh, the integrity of corals once they die. I don't know how far that uh, research has gone, if there is uh, any idea. And to the first presenter, I thought it was very interesting, the graphs you showed and the vertical variability. Uh, how is life distributed vertically-wise? That would be very interesting to know. Thank you. I'm the third, I'll, I'll answer the Arctic one. Um, the main reason is the lower carbonate ion concentration. That's the baseline problem. You've shown from, certainly from Helen's initial one, that ocean acidification reduces um, the carbonate ion concentration, which is the, the fun, one of the fundamental uh, reasons why the aragonite and calcite saturation state, so the that they become corrosive. It's lower because that's the way that the ocean absorbs CO2. By taking up CO2 through, that, through those equations, it actually cons consumes carbonate iron or reacts with carbonate iron to buffer the actual pH increase. If it wasn't for that, the pH reduction would be even further. As the waters move towards the pole, both in the Pacific and in the North Atlantic, they get colder and then they take up more CO2. By the time they get to the Arctic, you've got a really low carbonate iron. Plus the dilution, as you correctly said, the fresh water dilutes the carbonate iron even more and also changes the, the equilibrium between the different species. But the main one is that lowering, just lowering. If you think of it as the, the, the reason that the ocean is so good at taking up CO2 is that compared to fresh water is there's a soup of reactions. There's a, lots of complex ways in which the hydrogen ion can react or different, different reactions. Once you di dilute that, you reduce the capacity of the ocean to take up CO2 or at least compensate for the pH reduction. So. Hello. Um uh, so thank you for uh, the question as well. So I'll jump in on the... So um, regarding the, the distribution of life, uh, I think that, I mean, it's, it's a bit everywhere, obviously. And uh, I mean, and there is obviously at, at surface um, where the, there is light, there is the, the opportunity for uh, a lot of algae to grow and therefore they, are, they, they become the food for many types of animals from fishes to small crustacean. Uh, then uh, the seafloor, particularly in, in the shelf sea, so the more shallow area, they can still receive quite, quite a lot of 
of food that is sinking down. And so uh, they are generally more uh, productive area. But as Seb was showing, even in the deeper part of the ocean, there, there is still life and life as class as complex or, or organism and not just bacteria because then bacteria that is still life is everywhere. But even uh, in, the, in, in the deep ocean, you have the deep water coral, you, you have uh, fishes that are adapted to live at, at, at those depths. So it's, it's a bit everywhere and it's a bit hard then to uh, draw gradient where there is more, more or less. Generally in the sunlit part of, of, of the ocean is more, more thriving and in the shallow part of the ocean is generally again more more thriving but it's a bit everywhere Deb, to comment on that if you if you have any comments to add sebastian thank you uh, yes so very nice question about uh, the rate of scale of this the change. rate of scale of this the rate change. of scale of this the change. rate of scale of this the rate change. of scale of this change. Change. I can hear a lot of feedback I'm not sure if that's myself. a lot of feedback I'm not sure if that's a lot of feedback I'm not sure if that's a lot of feedback I'm not sure if that's a lot of feedback I'm not sure if that's a lot of feedback Okay. Um, so yes, really nice question. And so really nice question. Going back when we originally started looking at the impacts of ocean acidification, a lot of our work was focused on live corals. You know, this is where a lot of our focus was. But then we did the long-term experiments and we saw how the growth rates of live coral changes. But then we found, realized, realized that we need to be taking a much larger focus on the dead coral skeleton as well. And so we know and that so this, know, from a, in, so looking in situ at reefs which are already living at the forefront of environmental change, we can see that this change I'll be nice to remove my headphones. There we go. So we know that so we know that ocean acidification can lead to this ecosystem scale from reefs which are already living at the forefront of ocean acidification. But the only rate of the only the only timescales we have so far from a one-year experiment which we did, and we've seen that the porosity increases in the dead coral skeleton. So this is that it's a great question, and this is the key thing that we need to get into now. So we've started new long-term experiments where we're taking monthly measurements to see what that rate of change is with the porosity in the cold with coral skeletons. And that's when we can start to bring it in and work it up to have it in scales to see what that half-life is as, as, as you want to see at what point will that ecosystem change. With the feedback, so maybe we can come back to you in a second if we, if that's all right. Um, but I think we have another question from the floor for now while we try and sort that issue out. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for Richard Bellaby. Uh, very interested in these localized coastal effects and amplification of ocean acidification impacts. I think these are very challenging. I wonder, Richard, if you would comment on the integrated um, catchment management issues, which I think are increasingly pressing, particularly for our global carbon cycle, loss of soil carbon, and what this does both to loss of carbon from land, but also to the um, changes in our coastal oceans that I think you are outlining there. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think that the next step, it's a huge step, is that ocean acidification research is no longer an ocean problem or a, an ocean challenge. It's, it, it goes everything to working with and understanding and uh, improving everything from hydrological management, water, yeah, water management and agricultural uh, practices to forestries. Um, also, especially in the cryosphere, is to work very closely with the permafrost specialists um, I mean, not no. I, I, this shouldn't be just an Arctic problem. I mean, you see already challenges in the Baltic Sea, which are due to in in the north big uh, changes in ocean acidification regulated by uh, changing fluvial inputs and organic. In the south, we see weathering, but also the transport of those weathering uh, into the south. So every yeah, every sub region has to work. Um, throughout the watershed, from from the from from the source to the oh, 
to the sea floor, but that's a huge problem. But at least a source to the shelf ocean is the first step. Thank you, Richard. Um, have we got any further questions from the floor? No, we think, uh, well, I think it's, um, I'll probably wrap up there then and just say thank you very much to all the participants for joining us today. Um, I hope you felt it's a, been a useful session to really understand the impacts of acidification, how actually it's not just this global issue that we have to worry about. It actually is relevant to societies and communities today, never mind what it's going to be like in the future. Um, so I'd like to just take a moment to thank you again all the speakers and Sebastian online. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and hopefully we'll have a successful COP um, event. Thank you.